Welcome everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Leveraging Child Care Consumer Education Websites During Emergencies and Disasters. We are happy you are joining us today. Before we get started, I would like to go over some housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. There is a chat panel available there for you. You can use it to enter your comments or questions um, that you may have throughout the conference or the, throughout the webinar today. Um, if you experience any technical issues, please enter them in the uh, chat panel and we will work with you to troubleshoot. Although most of your uh, technical issues can be resolved by refreshing your browser. If you accidentally close one of the uh, panels, like the chat panel, the video panel, or the slide panel, you can restore your view settings by clicking on the circular arrow icon. Um, it is the furthest icon to the left. By clicking that, you can restore your video settings and you can um, bring everything back up. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to one of our presenters to get us started. Amy. Thank you, Violetta. Welcome, everyone. We are glad you could join us today for our webinar about leveraging your consumer education website during emergencies and disasters. We want to take a moment to introduce who we have on the call and also hear from you. Sorry about that. The slide would not advance, and then it went too far. Let me back up just a moment there. My name is Amy Page. I'm an Early Childhood Systems Consultant with the State Capacity Building Center Intensive Technical Assistance Team. I'm joining from North Georgia today. My apologies for not being able to join you via video due to con connectivity restraints. Um, I'd like to take a moment now for my colleagues on the call to have a chance to introduce themselves and to say hello as well. So I am going to turn it over to Mel. Hi everyone, I'm Mel Banks and I'm joining from Louisville, Kentucky today and I am also on the State Capacity Building Center team with Amy. And I. And I am Josh DeLung uh, with ICF Next Government, um, which uh, part of my work is funded by the SCVC. Uh, and I'm calling today into the webinar from the DC metro region. Back to you, Amy. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Josh and Mel. We're going to hear a lot more from Josh and Mel in just a moment. Before we jump into the information today, we would like to get an idea of who we have on the call. And so we would ask for you to just take a moment to respond to this poll by choosing the role that best fits you. If you don't see your role um, listed there, feel free to let us know what your role is using the chat panel. We'll give yourself a moment to um, give everyone just a moment to log into the poll and select your option. Looks like the responses have slowed down a little bit, so we're going to go ahead and give everybody just another second or two to respond to the, the poll on the screen. Great. Thanks for the responses. It looks like the majority of us um, on the call today are state government professionals, and then we had Quite a few that listed, or a few folks that listed other. Um, if you get a moment to uh, post that, it looks like we have uh, someone with child care resource and referral, um, and also a tribal lead agency subsidy manager. Great. We're really glad to have everyone on the call with us this afternoon, and appreciate you taking a moment to let us know what role you set in. Um, Our content today, um, as you see here on the screen, are our uh, objectives for our session today. We will discuss how you can best leverage your consumer education website as a tool for timely and effective communication during an emergency or disaster. More specifically, we will be discussing the following. The first is how you can use your consumer education website to really provide families and child care providers with helpful, 
accurate information that they can use both during and after an emergency. Also, what some best practices are that you can use to ensure that the information you post on your consumer education website is easy to find and read. And we'll discuss what kinds of resources and content may be helpful to post on your website in order to help your stakeholders navigate in an emergency or disaster. We are also going to be sharing a suite of resources the State Capacity Building Center specifically created to help you better leverage your consumer education website so that you can communicate more effectively with families and providers during an emergency or a disaster. A jurisdiction's Child Care and Development Fund, or CCDF, supported child care consumer education website should be the trusted source for useful, up-to-date child care information for stakeholders. This is particularly crucial during and after any emergency or disaster when stakeholders are experiencing a high amount of stress and may be in urgent need of accurate, time-sensitive information. While other organizations may share emergency-related information across multiple websites, your child care consumer education web website should synthesize all information related to child care in one place for your audience. This will help families and providers more easily find the key information they need when they need it. By providing well-organized, timely, relevant, and easy to understand information, you will strengthen your consumer education website's credibility with your audience as the go-to child care resource for your jurisdiction. Accordingly, it is crucial to consider how you can leverage your child care consumer education website to better prepare, inform, respond to, and support your stakeholders during and after an emergency or a disaster. Now that we've talked a little bit about why the consumer education website is a crucial communications tool during an emergency or disaster, we want to talk for just a moment about how you can use it as such. Um, in times of an emergency, you should use your consumer education website to really share the critical information with both families so that they can make informed choices about child care and access helpful resources and also with providers so they may continue to provide healthy and safe care and stay informed about policy updates or changes. There are a few ways you can go about doing this. Um, you should always try to drive traffic to your site by promoting your website via social media, email correspondence, um, also by coordinating with state partners to share your website as a resource, or working with your web developers to apply search engine optimization to ensure your audience can easily find your website via an online search. Also consider a feature that allows for families or providers to receive regular email or text updates on the emergency-related child care information. You want to make sure that you ensure that this feature includes only critical updates, that it is specific to child care, and directs people back to your website. Your child care consumer education website could be full of useful information, but of course if users don't know how or when to access it, then it will not get used. Um, and then lastly, you also want to always make sure that you're linking to reliable local, state, and national resources. You want to be sure to provide links, um, for example, to your state's emergency management hub or health department website um, for any other guidance that families and child care providers might need. Link to child care specific recommendations from the Centers for Con Disease Control and Prevention. And remember that families and providers are coming to your website for information on how an emergency is specifically affecting local child care programs and access to them, so ensure you are including information that is relevant to their needs. Today we will review how you can use these best practices to better leverage your website during a disaster or an emergency and use it to communicate key information with families and providers. We will also share information about the next webinar where we will have an opportunity to take a deeper dive into building effective communications plans and hear from experts around a variety of aspects of communications. With that in mind, it's now my pleasure to turn things over to Josh who will provide some suggestions on how to leverage your consumer education website by posting content that is well organized, accessible, easy to find and easy to understand during an emergency or, or disaster. So Josh, over to you.
All right, great, thank you, Amy. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about leveraging your consumer education website and the various considerations around making sure that uh, the website meets the needs of families, especially during an emergency or disaster. Uh, I, I think a lot of the things that we'll cover are actually important all of the time and uh, just become elevated and, and even more important when uh, folks need an even more frictionless experience during times of high stress and high need, and they're trying to find information very quickly. So, uh, you know, the following information kind of recommendations that I'm going to talk about in this next section uh, is really about helping people quickly and easily find content uh, on the website and uh, also give some recommendations around usability to make sure that uh, they don't encounter a lot of frustration or issues when doing so. Uh, I'll also say I just want to spotlight some of these uh, resources around emergency preparedness, response, and recovery content uh, that SCBC has developed. It's a new suite of resources, and uh, these are going to actually be available uh, very soon on the Early Childhood Training and Technical Assistance website. Uh, so I would encourage you to, to check these out. Uh, there's going to be uh, some information around responding to disasters and emergencies uh, in the context of helpful child care information that can be shared, uh, as well as recovering from emergencies and disasters. Uh, there's going to be a tip sheet related to that with some resource topics, as well as frequently asked questions uh, that CCDF administrators may consider uh, when developing content to put on the consumer education website. Uh, we also have some tips for families and providers, uh, as well as uh, a guide for leveraging child care uh, consumer education websites uh, to help with communicating critical information to families and providers in the general public during times of emergency. And then finally, uh, there is an assessment tool uh, available. And the purpose of that resource is really to help CCDF lead agencies assess how well the agency uh, used the consumer education website to communicate with stakeholders during an emergency. So I'll jump right into the core of the content here, but again, we're really talking about how do we make sure that the content that we're sharing is useful and timely uh, for the target audiences of your consumer education website. Uh, so really about focusing on the needs of the audience, ensuring that they can find critical information quickly and easily, that they're then able to understand that information because it's written in plain language, it's, it's very user-friendly content, uh, to make sure that you're reducing any confusion, and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that, and then uh, providing the updates to the information, to the content regularly and consistently. So uh, in terms of focusing on the needs of your audience, there's, there's a lot that can go into that, but it's really about listening to user feedback. Uh, so that might be something that you get from community forums, uh, through your, your call center, uh, through social media monitoring. There's a lot of ways that you might hear from your kind of constituencies about the information uh, that they need out of the consumer education website. And of course, that, that information, those needs may change rapidly during times of crisis. And so the content uh, likely needs to adapt along with that. Um, and so, for example, parents may have questions uh, regarding whether their child care provider is open. They may have questions about the... Uh, status of a child care subsidy. Providers may have questions regarding sort of the interim regulation changes uh, during times of crisis and, and emergencies. So there's a lot of uh, evolving needs that really needs, need to uh, be raised up to be the focus uh, of what the content should be conveying to audiences during a time like this. Uh, we want, also want to make sure that that information, even if you are tailoring it, is easy to find. Uh, sometimes you might have really great content on the consumer education website, but if it's difficult for people to locate it, that, that's another issue entirely. So uh, there's a lot that can go into this. Some simple things like colors and, and typefaces and placement in terms of how you uh, kind of architect the information, uh, use different headers and, and visual design elements, all of that can help bring the proper amount of attention. Uh, but there's also you know, making sure that the, the content is logically structured from an information architecture perspective uh, to fit the way that, that your users might actually look for it. In terms of 
uh, making user-friendly content. I mentioned plain language earlier. There's also an, an element of that uh, that uh, relates to the visual hierarchy of the information. What's most important? What's second most important? What's third most important? Uh, making sure that you're taking appropriate use of headers, breaking up content that's sort of scannable uh, and relates to the way that people use the web. Uh, and in terms of plain language, making sure that you're avoiding terms that are maybe too scientific, too kind of medical, uh, acronyms, jargon, remembering that consumer education uh, content is for consumers, for families, for um, folks uh, of all abilities, which we'll talk about a, a little bit more in depth later. So when we say plain language, that's really what we mean is, is breaking the content down to, you know, what's the simplest thing that will work to convey the information uh, that we need. Uh, and then, of course, being just, just clear and concise as much as possible, uh, trying to avoid confusion or duplication with uh, different guidance posted in different areas. So making sure that you have some governance uh, in place uh, in order to uh, go back and update content or to archive older guidance when new guidance comes out. Uh, and making sure that uh, all of that is uh, consistent and timely. All updates are time stamped and that you're just communicating uh, kind of regularly and clearly about what's the latest information in terms of what you're posting. So actually this example is from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, so this is uh, one example of uh, sharing useful and, and timely content in relation to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you know, we've all learned from this experience, I think, the importance of, of having a plan in place to communicate with, with families and providers during emergencies. And so this is one example of how Wisconsin is, is doing that from a content perspective. Uh, you can see that the uh, content is, is highlighted. It has its own spot in terms of navigation on the site. Uh, there are appropriate headers and links. Uh, there is descriptive text. There's a visual element to call attention to this. Uh, and so you can see that um, clearly there's, there's a content structure here. So figuring out what structure works best for your organization and kind of having that documented, uh, you know, even before a crisis strikes, makes it a lot easier to then say, okay, we, ha we have sort of the template for responding to a time like this. Uh, now we just have to go and fill in the blanks with the latest guidance and, and the latest content. So we've, talk, we've talked about uh, how to create the content, how to display the content, but we haven't talked yet about how to promote the content. How do we actually get people to it? So that's, that's a big and important part of this too. It's not just uh, if, you, if you build it, they'll, they'll come kind of thing. Um, with the web, there are some, some tactics that uh, we can deploy to make sure that our target audiences, that families and providers are, are able to find the website, able to find these contents and, and resources that uh, states, territories, and tribes may have for them. So uh, making sure uh, to do this through things like search engine optimization so that people can find uh, the website and the resources through search. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about that in a moment. Um, and also using tactics like social media outreach or even email marketing. So uh, in, in times like this, especially people are increasingly turning to social media for accessing information. Uh, there's a lot out there in terms of, you know, what, what's real information, what's not. And so they may be looking to um, your organization as, you know, a trusted entity that they could, they could get information from uh, during this time. So social media is a great way to intercheck that, that voice of, of reason and, and um, you know, accurate information coming right from, from the source from your organization and direct them to your website. I will note, you know, that it, it's not all about uh, clicks, right? So, so measurement, gathering metrics uh, is, are definitely important things. You want to look at your benchmarks and you want to look at your metrics over time because that's how you're going to know, you know, what outreach tactics are most effective, what, what's working and what's not, what content is most important to people. So all those traditional, uh, you know, reach and engagement metrics and, and uh, looking at things like, like visits, um, definitely important to figuring out if, if what you're doing is, is paying off or not. But the real end goal here uh, is, is user focused, right? We're really here to support families and, and providers. So it's, it's not so much we're saying uh, promote your resources so you can 
get more more views or more clicks on them. Um, although that you know that's definitely a great secondary uh, result of this, but it's really about what works best for uh, getting timely and and accurate information into the hands of the people who need it right now. So I'm going to pause there because I mentioned uh, search engine optimization. And, uh, you know, this is a really uh, important piece of promoting your content uh, to target audiences because a lot of people turn to search engines like Google and, and Bing. And uh, if you're, the content on your website hasn't been optimized for search, uh, it can make it much more difficult for them to find it. They may get led astray to other sources that, that aren't your organization, um, or they may just not be able to find what they need in a timely fashion. So there are uh, several aspects of this. There's kind of the content SEO aspect of this, which is more about is the content uh, written for humans, essentially, and is it relevant to what they're searching for? But there are also technical search engine optimization or SEO pieces. Uh, looking at, at kind of the, the back end of some of the elements of your content, like, like metadata uh, and meta descriptions that help people understand and help search engines uh, crawl your site and understand what's there and, and where to rank it and whether it's relevant or not to their search and whether they should click through. So this is, again, a, a really big piece of promoting the content because for a lot of websites, most traffic does come in through search engines. Um, and so we'd like to take a minute to, to just do a poll related to this and, and ask, uh, how easily do you think that uh, it, it is for users to find con your consumer education website through an online search? So for example, uh, if they were to go to their preferred search engine and type in you know, child care in you know, whatever jurisdiction you happen to be in or, or some similar phrase, uh, could they uh, find that uh, you know, not visible? Would it be visible to them? Uh, is it visible on the first uh, results page of the search engine or somewhere beyond that? So if you take a moment and uh, just vote for that, and I'll give everyone a few seconds to do that. Hi, everyone. It looks like we had some technical difficulties with Josh, so I'll pick it up from here. Thank you for taking the opportunity to respond to the poll. So it looks like uh, quite a few of you say that your search is visible or your site is visible, um, but not on the first search engine result page, or it's visible, um, but it it's maybe not the first result. So um, that's really great information to have. Some of you all are doing fantastic. Your site is ranked first. Um, this, is, this is really excellent information to have when you're thinking about how to position um, your site and how easily it is for folks to find your site, especially when you're thinking about them trying to navigate to your site during a disaster or an emergency. Um, so one of the resources, we have a couple resources that can help you um, promote and improve your search engine optimization. Um, as well as um, to help with other improvements with your consumer education website. So you see those two listed here. Um, one is the State Capacity Building Center's Guide for Increasing Search Engine, Engine Optimization. And uh, that has some relatively simple ways to format your website content um, and the technical aspects of your website so that search engines will be able to better find your site and direct folks there. And then for more information, you can also look at our social media strategies uh, resource, which can help give you some additional 
um, tips and, and recommendations on how to use social media to guide people to your site or to supplement the information that you're sharing. All right, and it looks like Josh is back with us, so I'm gonna hand it back over to him. All right, excellent, thanks Mel. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties. The uh, connection crashed for me, but it looks like you already talked about the resources that I was going to mention for everyone um, for social media strategies and, and search engine optimization. So I would just encourage folks that if you uh, haven't <laughs> uh, done uh, some SEO work for your Consumer Red website or you're, if you're not sure, uh, as I, I think I saw some folks were indicating in the in the poll right before it kicked me out, <laughs> uh, that SEO guide there is uh, a really good tool uh, to give you some, some, I think, easy to understand but uh, detailed guidance on increasing uh, SEO for your, for your site. So I'd encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, so the, uh, the other area that we've alluded to in the conversation thus far is related to accessibility. Um, and so you, uh, folks uh, may be familiar with uh, this as uh, Section 508 or as uh, WCAG <laughs> uh, 2.0 is, is another uh, way that those standards are uh, referred to sometimes. But with what we're really talking about when we say accessibility uh, is ensuring that people can get the information on the website uh, regardless of, of their abilities. So, you know, if they um, have a, a seeing or hearing impairment or, or whatever uh, the case may be, uh, we want to make sure that we're still serving uh, those, those folks uh, as, as part of our, our audiences. Uh, and so this goes to uh, several aspects when we talk about accessibility. So you'll see here that um, we're talking about providing translated information. So we don't always think about uh, translation as maybe an, an area when we, we talk about accessibility. But for a lot of folks in a lot of uh, different areas, uh, you may be serving audiences um, who uh, speak a, a language that's that's not English, you know, maybe Spanish or French or Korean. Um, and so thinking through your strategy for how are you going to serve those uh, families and, and, and those providers um, is a really important piece uh, in relation to accessibility. Um, we didn't call it out on the, the resources slide just a, just a moment ago, but there actually is um, in the same suite of information with those resources uh, on the, uh, the ECTOS uh, website, uh, there's actually a translation guide there too. And that gets into uh, some more details about uh, different options that you have from an IT perspective for translating information um, kind of based on different user needs and uh, budgets and capabilities. Uh, so that you can deliver that content to folks appropriately. We've already touched on plain language a bit, so I, uh, I won't dive uh, too deep into that again. Uh, but the other piece that I will talk about here is are some of the more technical aspects that folks may think about uh, usually when they're thinking about accessibility, which are making sure that assistive technologies like screen readers uh, are able to navigate through websites and, and help uh, users consume that content. So a lot of the things that go into to enabling that uh, are things like alt text or alternative text. Um, so those would be things like uh, text that would be uh, a descriptor for an image if someone can't see that image so that the screen reader can can read a description of the image to them so they know what's there. Uh, and another piece of that that is pretty important is uh, accessible rich internet application labels or ARIA labels. Um, and those do things like tell assistive technologies, uh, hey, this thing is a heading at the top of the page. This is a button in the middle of the page. So um, you know what may be apparent to somebody who is uh, physically looking at the page, it, you know, uh, it may not be to someone who can't do that. And so the ARIA labels help uh, further describe different actual uh, visual elements of a, of a page. Um, and of course, information, hierarchy, labels, headings, and all of those things are also quite important uh, so that if someone's using, say, keyboard-only navigation and tabbing through the info um, based on their ability, uh, they can do that in a way that's logical um, and moves through the, the page in the intended content order. And then finally, I think a lot of folks are probably familiar with this one, but uh, thinking about contrast ratios, 
uh, using a 4.5 to 1 contrast ratio at a minimum. And so what we mean by that is making sure that it's, it's easy to see images, especially easy to see text. Uh, on a site uh, based on the contrast between the, the text color and the color behind it, the background color. So, um, you know, this is sort of just a design best practice too, that you don't want to use white text on a bright yellow background, for example. Uh, but it's also an important element of uh, considering accessibility for things like color blindness as well as low vision users. Uh, so another poll, um, the poll was the bad luck for me last time, so I'm hoping this one is not. Uh, but uh, this one is about how recent, uh, recently do you conduct accessibility scans for your consumer education website? Uh, and so your options here are uh, never have or are not sure if you've scanned it before, uh, monthly or more frequently, uh, or perhaps a little uh, further out than that. Uh, so I'll give folks a moment to vote in this poll uh, right now. All right, we'll give folks just a couple more seconds. It looks like it is slowing down on the voting. Oh, there's a couple more popping in. It's a fight between never, never have and annually. And I think never have is going to win. Uh, but that's okay, because we have a resource for that. <laughs> So uh, this is the uh, consumer education uh, guide for designing consumer ed websites that are accessible to all families. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about accessibility, how do you even get started with, with doing a, an audit of the accessibility in your site? What are some, some good best practices and, and strategies and examples to consider uh, as you make your consumer ed site more accessible? Uh, this is another great resource that's available uh, for you to do that. So I would, again, encourage uh, folks, especially those who um, say that uh, you're not sure if there's ever been that kind of scan done on your site, to, to definitely check out that, that resource. Um, so thanks uh, for your time. I hope that uh, this was helpful in terms of uh, learning a little bit more about how to uh, structure the content uh, of your consumer education website, how to promote it, and how to make sure that it's accessible uh, to all of your audiences once you promote it and uh, get them there consuming that content. Uh, so next, I will hand it back off to Mel to talk a little bit more about communicating with families. Thanks, Josh. So Josh just spent a lot of time talking about communications during a crisis or an emergency and how important it is for those communications to be clear and timely. So what we wanna do in this next section is share with you some recommendations for content that you may consider putting on your consumer education website to promote that practice of clear and, and timely communication. So I want to start by sharing a valuable resource that you can use to support your work with families and providers. Childcare.gov, as you can see here on the screen, is the National Consumer Education website funded by the CCDBG Act and supported by the Office of Child Care to ensure that families and the general public have access to transparent information about the child care choices available to them. As the National Child Care Consumer Education website, childcare.gov is the trusted source of, for families to learn about federal and state child care resources. And to respond to the urgent need for up-to-date child care related information during COVID-19 pandemic, childcare.gov launched a new dedicated COVID-19 resources and information webpage in April 2020. And you can see a screenshot of that page here. This resource page provides links to an array of COVID-19 response and recovery issues for each state and territory to help families access the child care information that they need to make informed child care choices during this crisis. And you can navigate to this page um, by clicking on the yellow banner at the top of childcare.gov. It's very easy to find and prominently displayed on childcare.gov's homepage. 
So this is a view of one of the tabs within the state level information that's available on childcare.gov. And I wanna talk a little bit about how this can help families. So childcare.gov helps families connect directly to resources that help them learn about their childcare options and make more informed childcare choices, and also to engage in the development of their child and learn about a full array of resources and supports available to them directly in their state or territory. So childcare.gov see your state resources section provides direct links to resources for each state and territory across uh, several categories. This is a shot of the resources available through understanding and finding childcare and addresses things such as jurisdictions, childcare searches, uh, consumer education websites, the CCRNR site, licensing information, criminal background checks, and, and a lot more information. There are also sections um, within the state resources, such as financial assistance for families that we'll talk about or link to WIC, TANF, SNAP, CHIP, and energy assistance. Uh, there's a section for health and social services to link to things like child support, child protective services, early intervention, Medicare, home visiting, mental health, and car seat safety. And then there's also a section on child development and early learning. So it will link to your state or territory specific um, information on Head Start, special, uh, special education, developmental screening, child development information, and parent support. So as a child care leader or a key staff member, how can childcare.gov help you? And there are a couple things that it can do. It can help you learn from other ju jurisdictions. So you can use childcare.gov to see how other jurisdictions have approached key components of their consumer education website, uh, including design features and content elements. Uh, you may be able to identify elements that will work well in your jurisdiction and incorporate that information into planning continuous improvement of your consumer education website. You can also use childcare.gov to access your jurisdiction's resources more readily. So use childcare.gov to easily access your resources that pertain to children and families in one place. So your state resource page not only provides direct links to your jurisdiction's childcare related resources, but it also links to family financial assistance, health and social service resources, and child development and early learning resources. So instead of searching online for these websites, you can book childcare.gov and use it to access these sites. And you can also link to childcare.gov through your consumer education website uh, so that families and providers can go to see your state resources or your jurisdiction's resources all in one place. So as we saw from the example that Josh shared from Wisconsin, um, a well-organized website can help connect families to the information that they need to make informed decisions on childcare. Part of this strategy includes linking families with quality resources. So we wanna talk in this section a little bit about some re resource recommendations that we can make about how to improve um, communications with families, and then we'll talk about providers um, during times of emergency and crisis. One of the things that you can do is think about the tools that already exist on your consumer education website. So if you have a childcare search tool, can you adapt that search tool to reflect emergency care or changes um, in response to an emergency? Can your child care search tool um, add a section about if a center is currently closed due to the emergency or if they have current availability or accepting uh, or providing care for essential workers. Sometimes to gather the data to adapt these tools, it's helpful to work directly with providers. So you could consider adding a provider portal to your site so that providers can update live availability or, um, or contact information, changes in hours or staffing, um, that can be helpful. You could also maybe conduct provider surveys that will help you plug in that information and keep it current and think about sending those out on a more regular basis if you're not doing that already. You could think about publishing a list or a map of emergency childcare. 
You can also think about tip sheets or resources that already exist either at the national or local level that can provide information that you know that families are going to be looking for in times of emergency. So um, one of the ways to judge on how you can curate these resources is to think about the questions that you're getting. Think about what questions are being asked in your email box, through the call center, um, what are you hearing in public forums, and make sure that that information is readily available on your consumer education website. Remember that you don't have to create all of this content yourself. There may already be some incredible resources that are out there um, through different technical assistance, uh, that has been provided in the past or national recommendations through things like the CDC or the World Health Organization. Really what you should focus on in your consumer education website is curating all of that childcare specific information into one place so that a family or a provider doesn't have to go to the T CDC site to look for um, health and safety information and then go to the state emergency response site to look for new executive orders or guidance from the state and then go somewhere else to look at um, you know changes in quality care or subsidy so you don't have to write all of that information but you can gather the facts and gather the the supports that are needed and put it all in one place on your consumer education website so that parents know and providers know that they can go there for the most up-to-date and helpful information. So this is an example of a resource that you could consider sharing with families. Um, in times of crisis, children may experience abrupt transitions in care or have difficult time pro uh, processing the changes in their normal routines. So you can connect families to resources to help them communicate with their children during emergencies or times of crisis. Remember when you're looking at these resources to make sure that you're providing information for all ages um, in child development. So for example, this is a tip sheet from the, health, uh, the Head Start Early Childhood Learning Knowledge Center that addresses how infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and young children may be impacted by crisis. And it links to additional resources on how families can support children during these events. You can also find great resources to share with families through the family area of childcare.gov. Um, and you can also look at the families and communities section of the Early Childhood and Technical Assistance website to find some good resources. Keep in mind that families are likely operating under high levels of stress when they're living through an emergency or disaster. Ensure that the resources that you create or share are succinct and they're written in plain language. So if childcare provisions are maybe buried within a broader executive order in your state um, or territory, or if they've been released in sections over time, it can be really hard to, uh, for parents to find and families to find the information that they need to make good childcare choices. So you can help to curate that information and bring it all together, um, build resources or tip sheets to help families connect with the information that they need. And one of the ways that you can do that is to think about building a frequently asked question resource. So FAQs are a good way to pull a bunch of information into one place in a way that families can very, very easily get the information that they need on specific topics. So it it really shows that you, but a well-developed FAQ can really show that you understand the needs of your target audience. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how it meets the needs of families, and then a little bit later, we'll talk about provider needs. Um, but, you know, it's important to think about families, uh, they're, they could be experiencing very high levels of stress during this time. Um, they're trying to, you know, maybe maintain a job and also make sure that their family is safe during a crisis or emergency. They may be experiencing housing disruptions. Um, so by building an FAQ and making it very accessible on your consumer education website, then families can uh, get the information when they need it. So if they've been working all day and they've been spending time with their children and then it's midnight and they really just need to understand what's going on with emergency child care, they can log on, they can find that information, they don't have to make a phone call, they don't have to wait on hold. Um, it's all 
there for them to access. So some, we're going to talk about some kind of buckets of information that you can uh, place in an FAQ, but some general overarching principles. Uh, make sure with your FAQs when you're posting them that they are time stamped. So as we know from our current situation, things change daily. Um, so if you're posting an FAQ, you want to make sure that you're updating it to match what's happening in the current environment and be responsive. And then it's helpful to kind of circulate out old information or make sure that any kind of information that you're posting in an FAQ is dated so parents know that it is the most recent information. So it's also helpful to think about content management practices with FAQs. Make sure you're using plain language. Um, also think about, you may link out to other resources, um, you know, like subsidy uh, links or resources for supporting children. Uh, make sure you embed those URLs as hyperlinks in text instead of posting big long URLs. Um, and then think about implementing a quality control uh, process so that you can make sure that old information is being cycled out, that information in your FAQs are accurate. And I'm saying this in the context of FAQs, but it really can apply to any information on your consumer education website. It's also helpful to make sure that you're posting unique FAQs for your stakeholder groups. And in this case, it's, it, we're going to talk about families and providers. Um, so when families go to look for answers to questions, there may be, uh, if you have a combined document, they may have to wade through a lot of information that doesn't necessarily apply to them. So if you make unique resources for your target audiences, it just makes it easier to find what you need in a timely manner. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about FAQs, um, frequently asked questions from families. So in the next few slides, we're going to talk about specific uh, topics that you may want to cover and provide some examples of questions uh, that you might consider including in your FAQs. Another general principle to think about is that you're answering questions across the um, the emergency experience, I'll say. So, uh, you know, when you're when an emergency has just happened um, or you're just entering uh, the a crisis has just happened in your jurisdiction and then maybe it's a few weeks out and then maybe you're starting to go into the recovery phase your FAQ should adapt based on what um, period of the emergency that you are in so this particular slide addresses questions that families may have around program operations and finding care. Um, this is you know, really relevant when an emergency just happened. Parents and families really want to know how they can ensure continu continuity of care for their children. Um, so this is an area where you can address questions like, how do I know if my child care center is open? If it's not, how do I find alternative care? Um, and, and, what if I need to provide school age care um, all all day for my school age child? Um, so you know, again, this is a great way to just kind of think about the questions that are coming into your organization or your agency, and then answer them here on how families can answer questions or get answers to questions about program operations and care. Uh, this could also be a great place to link to your child care search tool or your emergency child care listing. This next section talks about safety and precautions. Um, we know that this is especially relevant when responding to a health crisis. Um, so one of the important things here, and I mentioned it on the previous slide, is to really think about point in time. Um, you know, your, your safety requirements may change throughout the response of, of an event. So make sure that you keep these FAQs updated um, and time stamped. And be sure that you're, I mean, this is this is an opportunity to communicate with families about what they should expect from their provider. Uh, this could also be a great opportunity to promote communication with providers and, and help providers with this process by communicating to families what they should expect, right? So if, if maybe requirements for drop off and pick up are expected to change or there are new restrictions on what can and can't be brought into a facility this is a great place to share that with families if that is managed at a state or local level um, so that 
that parents really can understand the expectations and, and what's changing in a childcare environment. You also want to make sure that you're talking about payments and subsidies. Uh, you can address questions about just financial concerns in general, both with subsidy eligible and non-eligible families. And think about the fact that there may be families that are newly coming into uh, child care assistance programs. So maybe there is, uh, you know, you've, you've broadened the parameters for who is eligible for subsidy, or there are new groups of people that are eligible for emergency financial assistance. So these folks may be coming to your site and they've never navigated the system before. So it's a great time to use this area of your FAQ to promote um, those resources that folk, so that folks can easily navigate the process. Okay, so now that we've had the chance to talk about communicating with families, we want to look at a couple of resources that can support child care providers as well. So as we know, uh, this can also be an incredibly difficult time for providers of care. And your consumer education website can be a place that child care providers can turn to find the information that they need. We know that there are a lot of organizations out there that are trying to support providers at this time. And sometimes it's hard to kind of to curate and navigate all of that information as a provider to know what exactly is expected of you during an emergency response period um, and how to get the information that you need. So your consumer education website can be a place where providers can kind of rise above the noise and understand um, what the facts are and, and what your agency's recommendations um, would be for continuing to provide care throughout an emergency or disaster. So just like we did with families, we're going to look at a couple of resources and FAQ suggestions for providers. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the excellent resources that the Center for Disease Control has provided throughout the most recent uh, health crisis that we've experienced, but they also have a huge section of resources on caring for children in a disaster that can be applied across the board in a lot of different disaster and, and emergency scenarios. So this is just an example of one of those resources. Um, and again, a reminder that you don't have to recreate the wheel. There's a lot of good resources out there uh, that you can link to directly from your consumer education website. One thing I do want to recommend is that you don't just focus on these national resources. So if there are changes in policy or procedures um, or expectations at the local or state level, make sure that you're sharing those resources as well. Um, and then make sure again that your resources are current. So if you were to link to this resource from your consumer education website, or if you were to download uh, or have available for download resources or documents on your website, make sure you're checking in pretty regularly to make sure that you've got the most current version and that your hyperlinks are working. Now we're going to go over just a couple of FAQs that you may want to think about answering. Um, for providers. So one of the first sections that, that we want to highlight is in policy changes. So this is, this is where that provider uh, specific FAQ is really helpful because providers are navigating a whole different set of, of kind of policy and procedural changes during times of emergencies. And it's helpful to be able to direct them to the right and most current information. So you know, this can really help uh, strengthen and build on your re your existing relationships by providers too, by helping to reduce the stress on their end and finding that information. Um, so think about how you can link to uh, the most current guidance on uh, child care policy. And then also think about how you can communicate your plan with providers. So maybe this is the policy now, but this is when we think about revisiting it. Um, and also connect them with resources that will help them stay open and operational if they're available to 
at that time. So um, you can also think about new folks that are coming into the scene that want to provide care in times of emergencies, or maybe this has prompted them to become a new provider. Um, so there's just there are a lot of great resources and, and questions that you can answer in this policy change uh, section of your FAQ. You also probably want to address payment and subsidy um, and maybe how payments have changed or your payment practices have changed in response to an emergency, especially if there are new funds available to providers. This is a great place to highlight those. Um, and, and again, um, make sure that that your answers are current here. Uh, we know that this is a really large stressor for providers um, when they're trying to respond to new maybe health and safety protocols. They're gonna be looking for supports. Um, they're gonna wanna know how to keep their doors open and keep providing care. Um, so make sure that you're answering those questions where you can. Um, and also think about the fact that you can link to these resources in lots of other communications. So if you're sending out a press release, if you are, um, if you have some ability to kind of add links or share additional information on your state emergency response page, uh, if you have access to share things through social media, this is one of those pieces of your consumer education website that you can just continue to highlight over and over again until every provider in your area knows this is where they can go for information. It's a really powerful tool. And then finally, uh, you may want to think about operations and how those have been impacted by an emergency or disaster. So if, um, you know, child care agencies have, um, or I'm sorry, child care providers have changes in their spaces, like their, their actual structure has been affected by an emergency or disaster. Um, if you have new parameters around providing emergency care and who can do that and, and what they need to do and how they can apply for that system, these are really great uh, questions to answer in this section. You could also consider talking about how emergency uh, care providers could consider becoming uh, full-time care providers after the recovery phase. Oh, and one more, we had an extra one on providers, and, and that's really in the area of safety and prevention. This has been a hot topic for uh, families and providers throughout our most recent uh, health crisis. So, you know, this is another probably piece of your FAQ that providers are going to go to over and over and over again to find out how your uh, health and safety requirements have potentially changed in response to an emergency or disaster, and also how they're going to be held accountable for those things. Has, has your monitoring um, practice changed, and is there um, are, are there is there additional guidance from the national level? Like this is where those CDC and, and WHO resources can be really helpful. So now that we've talked a lot about FAQs um, and all of the work that goes into crafting those resources and keeping them current on the site, we want to hear from you. Um, I'd love for you to think a little bit about the most recent emergency that's happened in your jurisdiction, and maybe that's COVID-19, or maybe that's wildfires, or a, uh, you know, a, a storm, or other natural disaster. Did you post FAQs on your consumer education website? And if so, how did you post them? So I'm going to pull up a poll. And it just asks you to let us know, um, you know, did you post unique FAQs for families and providers or maybe different groups? Did you post one general FAQ? Maybe you just posted an FAQ for either families or providers, or maybe you didn't post FAQs at all. We'd love to hear how you're using those in your jurisdiction. Okay. Give you a couple more. I'm seeing, I'm probably seeing the results before you do. Let me share that. 
It looks like a fair amount of you posted a general FAQ and, and the next kind of group of you did unique FAQs. So there's, you all are using FAQs. If you have any um, learnings that you took away from FAQs and, and using FAQs and making them available to folks on your consumer education website, feel free to drop those in the chat. I'm sure folks would like to hear what works and, and what doesn't work. Um, but that's great to hear that folks are using FAQs. Um, you know, I think that they're just one of the easiest to navigate and understanding, understanding, easiest to navigate and understand um, of all of the tools and resources that you can share. And they really speak to the needs of your families and your providers and show that you as an agency are listening. So kudos to all of you that are posting. Um, if you haven't, I hope you've learned uh, a few things today here and, and maybe we'll think about implementing FAQs in the future. And thank you so much for sharing with us. So now that we talked about some specific resources for families and providers, I'm gonna hand it back to Amy to provide some helpful tips and share some additional resources that you can use to inform your work on your consumer education website during emergencies and disasters. Amy? Great, thanks so much, Mel, and thanks to you and Josh both for all of the valuable information um, we want to take just a moment before we review some resources to provide a quick recap of the most important things to consider with the content and the information that Mel and Josh shared this afternoon. Um, the first is to always make sure that you're driving your key audiences to your consumer education website by promoting it via social media as well as other outlets and also um, posting it um, and with stakeholder information and resources as well, making sure that your consumer education website is a dominant resource that shows up across um, resources and across websites. And then be sure to provide current and relevant links to trusted resources that your users will benefit from and also utilize a variety of communication channels to reach your users. Before I get into the resources, we just want to apologize for the audio and connectivity issues that we seem to be having this afternoon with Entrato system. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants, so those of you on the call this afternoon, as well as those that registered but maybe weren't able to, enjoy, to join. Uh, that follow-up email, we will be sure that we have the links to all of our main consumer education resource pages as well as the new suite of information that Josh mentioned, which will be posted in the next few days. Um, one additional note, um, as we've mentioned previously, the session today is being recorded. Uh, the good news is that from the presenter platform, the audio seems to have been consistent so far, and so we are hoping that recording will be clean and we will be able to post that. We will also be posting where uh, the same location that the resources will post, we will post the slide deck with all of the slides from today. So you will have access to that as well. And we will include that in the follow-up email. Um, here on, you sh on your screen, you see that um, these are some general sites where you can access additional consumer education resources. Um, the first link shown is for the consumer education resource page on the Office of Child Care website. And the second is for the Early Childhood Training and Technical Assistance System website. Um, the resources contained on both of those sites really um, provide guidance to states and territories as you're developing and implementing effective consumer education resources for the families and the providers that you serve. So there's a wide array of information specific to consumer education, but also for the, um, you know, topics in general. So as you're on the ECTAS site, for example, and um, there is a, a topic drop down where you can view things via uh, consumer education or health and safety or subsidy related information. So um, that's a, a key resource that you always want to make sure you um, have access to because there's a, a wide variety of information available. The screen that you see presented here are our consumer education resource guides that Josh mentioned earlier. I think a couple of you in the chat asked about 
the links for particular ones. Um, you can see the first one in the list there is the link for the accessibility resource guide. And we've also mentioned the search engine optimization today, which is the second one. Additionally, there are resource guides for um, measuring your web traffic and engagement, uh, improving your website with user research, and so that talks a little bit um, more in depth about analytics. And then um, the last two that are listed there are strategies around social media and branding, which Josh alluded to earlier as well with branding your consumer education website. In addition to those shown here, we also have a guide for best practices related to translation and another guide outlining the requirements for posting aggregate data. And so when we um, send the follow-up email, we'll be sure that you all have the, um, the link to the landing page where all of these resource guides from our prior webinar series are available. And that prior webinar series um, that occurred last calendar year uh, between April and December of 2019 had several different webinars uh, that the resources were built out to support, and those webinars are listed here. Um, they were held monthly, uh, like I said, last um, between April and December of 2019, and then following each webinar, we also had a 30-minute Ask Me Anything session that followed up a couple of weeks later where we could um, respond to questions from participants with the webinar. And so all of those recordings as well as slide decks from the webinars, the Ask Me Anything sessions, and um, a Q&A document that we did um, as a result of each webinar are available at that Consumer Education Webinar Series link that you see posted there at the top, and we will include that to you as well in the follow-up email. I want to take just a moment to remind you about the last webinar in this series, which is being held three weeks from today, which will be September the 17th. We, it will be at noon Eastern Time. Our topic will be around communication strategies for your child care consumer education website. And so we've talked a little bit today about how your child care consumer education website can be used as a really powerful tool um, to communicate with families, providers, and other stakeholders. And we're excited um, for that call that we'll have a panel of experts to provide some helpful tips on how you can build out communications plans and implementing those plans in times of crisis. Um, the registration link for that webinar was part of the series announcement sent out at the end of July. And we will um, give us just a moment. I will make sure that we can post that um, link right in the chat box um, for you right now. For those of you that still have access to the chat, that's the registration link for that session. We certainly hope that you can join us for that opportunity. Um, and as we wind down here, um, again, just apologies for the, the connectivity issues and just trust that we will follow up with the resources and the information for those of you that had trouble today. We would like for you to um, take just a couple of moments to respond to a couple of last questions for us. Um, this first poll, we just would like for you to respond and let us know how much your topic, um, how much, excuse me, your understanding about this topic improved as a result of today's webinar. So we'll give everybody just a quick moment to respond to that. Take just another couple of seconds for everyone to chime in. Looks like the voting is winding down a little bit. Thanks so much for your responses. Next, we would like to hear from you um, as well. There was a bit of delay with the slide up. You should now see that we're going into a, another poll about how likely you might be in using these strategies with your future work on your consumer education websites. And so again, we just would like for everybody to take a quick moment to respond to the options that you see on your screen now.
And again, we'll give everyone just a few more seconds to respond. Thanks so much again for your responses to that poll. The last question that we have for you, which should be pulling up, there it goes, um, is whether or not there are other topics that would maybe be of interest to you for a future webinar. So there's um, not a poll slide for that. We would, would love to just hear your, your thoughts or your ideas in the chat panel, if you'll take just a moment to drop any additional information um, or topics that would be of interest to you. there are not any that are right at the forefront of your mind right now, of course, we are always glad to hear um, from all of you as to um, what information will be most value, valuable to you and can help connect you with resources and um, develop information and, and gather um, potential ideas for additional webinars. So please send those along. Um, you can respond to us uh, via the follow-up email that comes out. And then I want to go ahead to and let you know that um, any questions regarding this topic that we didn't address in today's session, or if you just have questions in general around consumer education websites, feel free to contact us um, using the email address shown on your screen right there in the middle, Capacity Building Center at icf.com. This brings our webinar today to a close. Um, thank you, everyone, for your participation. We really appreciate your time today and all of the work that you and your teams do on a daily basis to keep your child care communities informed. Uh, we hope you have a really wonderful day and take care. Thanks so much.